Questions concerning Israel's future, they dominate today's headlines. Bible prophecies actually foretell the future of Israel, and End Time Ministries has a huge role to play in all of it. And we are going to analyze this End Time scenario on the next couple segments of the End Time Show. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dave Robbins with End Time Ministries. Thank you so much for joining me on this edition of the End Time Show. You know, if you follow the news at all, Israel dominates the headlines of just about every major news source every day. Newsweek reported that secret peace talks are underway for Israelis and Palestinians. Here's what's on the table. The Haaretz reported that Netanyahu that said that Israel rejects international dictates on final status solutions with the Palestinians. Well, the Jewish News Syndicate reported that Ehud Barak has stated that, hey, we need to hold elections by June to adopt a two-state solution. In other words, he's saying, let's get Netanyahu out of there and everybody in the Israeli Knesset that's willing to sign a peace agreement or in the Israeli politics, let's vote them in office and get this thing done. The Times of Israel has reported that the European Union's top diplomat, Josep Perel, has said, hey, the Palestinian state may need to be imposed on Israel from outside. In other words, taking their veto power away from proper peace negotiations. So with these and hundreds of other news headlines, everyone wants to know And many want to really control the future of Israel. But the Bible has the answers. And I'm going to go into a deep dive on today's program in all of this. Now, let me first mention Burst Gold. You know, elections in Taiwan, North Korea on the brink, Iran increasing its aggression and nuclear aspirations. I mean, there's a lot of global instability as we ourselves were plunged into the primary season. Well, have you sheltered your savings and investments of potential major setbacks to the economy? I mean, it's not too late to diversify an old IRA or 401k into gold. And Birch Gold Group can help you do just that. I mean, as opposed to many other investments, gold thrives in times of uncertainty and is an important part of of diversifying your savings. So here's how Birch Gold can help you make it part of your diversification. Birch Gold will help you convert, let's say, like an existing IRA or a 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold, and it doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket. So just visit birchgold.com slash end time for a free gold info kit. You know, with an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, countless five-star reviews, and thousands of happy customers, I would encourage you to arm yourself with the knowledge of diversification through precious metals. Visit birchgold.com slash endtime and claim your free info kit and protect your savings with gold today. So, the Bible foretells a final seven-year period that will immediately precede the Battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus to the earth. It also describes the specific event that will mark the beginning of the final seven years. I'm telling you, folks, if all of these news sources could understand the prophecies of the Bible, it would open their eyes so much to what's really going on and what the future holds for Israel and even much of the Middle East. I go on radio and television interviews all the time and I've got to explain to them the surface knowledge of Bible prophecy and they're like, oh my goodness, this ties right into these news stories. And I'm like, that's what we've been trying to tell you all along. So the Bible does describe the event that marks the beginning of the final seven years before the second coming of Jesus Christ in the Battle of Armageddon. And that's the reason we call it 
um, th this prophesied event, the prophecy with a date on it. We don't set the date, but the Bible says when this event happens, there's seven years left till this stuff wraps up. So it is of utmost importance that each of us understand this final seven-year timeline for Israel, this timeline of events, because our generation will undoubtedly be the ones that live during the fulfillment of these prophecies. And if you see, you say, well, how do you say that, Dave? Well, if you look at all the prophecies that are converging at the same time, we have to be the one. It's never been like this before. Never. Not in the history of mankind. All these prophecies converging one right after another, just right on top of each other, basically. And so we're going to go to Daniel 9.27. We'll start there because that prophesies that the Antichrist will confirm a covenant. Once you tie all the other verses into it, that the Antichrist will confirm a covenant with many for a final seven-year period. It says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. It's a week of years, a seven-year period. And in the midst of that week, halfway, three and a half years in, the Antichrist will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. It's the same thing prophesied about by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 and in, by the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter um, 2. And the Bible says, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. That's Daniel 9, 27. So the accord that's talked about here, the covenant that he will confirm, is going to be a confirmation of God's covenant with Abram that Israel would always have a homeland in the promised land, all the way back in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. And the fulfillment of this prophecy will be the signing of a peace agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I know, like I said, the, the headlines are screaming, oh no, Netanyahu rejects the two-state solution. And the, the uh, international community is trying to cram a two-state solution down Israel's throat. Well, they're actually going to get a two-state solution created. And there will be an agreement that brings that about. So this prophesied agreement, Daniel 9, 27, and other prophecies, the agreement does five things. Number one, it will establish a Palestinian state in Judea. It's the two-state solution they're talking about in just about every major news source. Judea, the modern-day West Bank. It will also allow the Jewish settlers that are presently living in Judea to remain in their homes, living as a Jewish minority in that new Palestinian state. And this is being talked about in the current efforts towards a peace negotiations in the news today. This qualification. This peace agreement, the prophesied peace agreement, will also place the Temple Mount under an internationally supervised sharing arrangement, which is going to allow Jews and Muslims both to worship there. Israel will also build her third temple as a result of this peace agreement. And the fifth most noticeable characteristic would be that Israel will retain control of Jerusalem throughout the end time. This peace deal that's coming up will allow for that. It's going to be, um, they're going to come to a, a loggerhead and they're not going to be able to decide. And so they're, they're going to say, look, let's, let's get all we can signed. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's, let's just put the Jerusalem uh, conversation off. Let's put that issue off to the, till a later date. And the Bible says it's going to be about seven years. So, since both the Israelis and the Palestinians are going to refuse to surrender their claims to Jerusalem. Obviously, resolving that dispute is going to have to be put on hold. So the status of Jerusalem, that's going to remain as it is now, but it's going to be temporary. And this is the reason the Bible says the agreement will be a seven-year agreement. It's not going to be a permanent agreement. So when you see this prophesied peace agreement, I'm telling you, folks, it's there, it's, it, look in your Israeli news sources. It's at the headline of all of them. And even the, uh, many of the United States major news sources, Europe, different ones. And so when you see this prophesied peace agreement, then you could know assuredly that the final seven years to the Battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ has begun. Now, 
this answers a lot of questions that are in the news. A lot of people have said, well, uh, will Iran realize her uh, aspirations to annihilate Israel off the face of the map? The answer to that is absolutely no. Israel will not be successful in annihilating Israel or the United States. Israel, the United States will be here all the way through. And also, it does help us to answer uh, many questions about the peace agreement, the two-state solution, how is all that going to be solved? The Bible answers all these questions. What's going to happen with the Temple Mount? How is that um, with the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the, the Dome of the Rock, the third synagogue, the third temple the Jews want to build? How's all that going to work? Well, it's going to be placed under a sharing arrangement, and the Muslims will be able to control part of it, and the Jews will control part of it, and that's where they will build their third temple. John, in Revelation chapter 11, was told to measure the temple, but don't measure the outer court, because it will be trodden down of the Gentiles. And so it's a, it's a sharing arrangement that will be placed up on the, on the temple mount. And there are some of the most radical Jews that are trying, pushing for the building of the third temple. I've actually talked to them personally. They're friends of mine. And they have told me that in order to be, if, if there was a peace agreement in the future that would allow us to build our third temple up on the temple mount, and we had to leave the Dome of the Rock, even though we believe that God will remove that at the right time, that in order to build that, we would be willing to build it in that courtyard, the ten, about eight or ten acre courtyard, north of the Dome of the Rock. And so a lot of people think that, that there's no way that's going to happen. That is going to happen. Now, the question then becomes, well, hey, Dave, how close are we to this agreement? Well, the international community is heavily pressuring Israel to enter into a peace agreement with the Palestinians as the solution to this decades-old conflict which has global leaders refocused on the region after the October 7 massacre that happened when the, the uh, Hamas invaded from Gaza into Israel and killed just over uh, 1,200 people and took uh, 240-some hostages. Now the global leaders are focused on this. We've got to get a solution done here. This can't ever happen again. And, of course, along with that, Israel's war on Gaza. Now, Newsweek published an article on February the 13th. It was titled, Secret Peace Talks Are Underway for Israelis and Palestinians. Here's what's on the table. An excerpt from that article states this, and I'm quoting, The proposal to peace, this peace negotiation, this peace proposal, is not another think tank exercise, but rather one that we believe will soon be formally adopted in one way or another, and we assess that it will be acceptable to the Israeli government and that follows Netanyahu's odious assemblage. And there are a lot of people that would like to get Netanyahu out because they say he'll never um, sign a two-state solution. And they believe that there are people in Israel in their government or politicians that are willing to do that. So Ehud Barak said, hey, let's just have elections, get not Netanyahu out, and get the ones in that'll sign this deal. And because they're saying Netanyahu's government is on life support, and also that it al this agreement aligns with the groundwork already being done by the Americans and the Europeans among key regional stakeholders, i.e. Saudi Arabia and many of the others, and it is currently being examined by European governments and on Capitol Hill, and will soon be presented to senior officials at the White House. And through this has been building, though this has been building for years, the ruinous war launched by Hamas on October 7th has focused all the minds on this region. While Saudi Arabia did not join the 2020 Abraham Accords, maintaining its demand for the creation of a Palestinian state first, there are indications that this position has shifted. Under the proposed framework, Saudi Arabia and other holdout countries would become full partners and agree to normalize relations with Israel up front. In exchange, Israel would agree up front to recognize, in principle, a demilitarized Palestine 
whose borders would constitute an area equivalent in size to the West Bank and Gaza. Now, this is what's being reported in Newsweek about a, a few weeks ago. So it says the framework also makes provisions to allow some settlers living far from the pre-67 borders out in Judea to remain in Palestine, they say Palestine, I say Judea, if they wish to under Palestinian sovereignty. In the new state of Palestine is what they're saying. So this is one of the characteristics of the, prop, of the prophesied peace agreement from Daniel 9, 27 and Matthew 24 and what others that you tie them all together. And there are also other provisions that sound very similar to the biblical characteristics of the prophesied peace agreement laid out here. Some past and present political leaders in Israel believe that if they could retire Netanyahu, who was opposed to a peace deal, they could then sign an agreement with the Palestinians. Many of them are willing to sign today. Ehud Barak would sign one of them right now. I just read an article on it the other day. And he was saying, look, let's get Netanyahu out of here. New elections, let's get this thing done. Now, I want to tell you, I cannot say whether this will result in the prophesied peace agreement. I don't know that. However, I do know it is one of the next two events to be fulfilled on God's prophetic timeline. And so it's, it's, if it, I mean, it's just around the corner, folks. All of these prophecies from the Old Testament prophets concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ, these, all this big long line, this timeline of prophecies, this peace agreement and the Sixth Trumpet War, World War III, are the next two events on God's prophetic timeline that will be fulfilled. So it could happen at any time. You say, well, what about the Middle East? Because that's a question on many people's mind. Well, Jesus prophesied the end time generation that they would see wars and rumors of wars. So, i.e., Israel and Gaza. That's one of the wars and rumors of wars. Ukraine and Russia. Wars and rumors of wars. However, and Israel may, may get into other wars. They may go into war with uh, the, the um, Hezbollah up in Lebanon, or maybe some other ones. However, there is a war, and I would say this is the war that's coming that will emanate from the Middle East region and will result in the killing of one-third of the world's population. Let me let that sink in. That's over about 40 times the deaths of World War II. And this war is called the Sixth Trumpet War because it occurs at the sounding of the Sixth Trumpet as described in Revelation 9, verse 13 through 16. I say that, what you say, well, why do you say that's one of the next events to occur on God's prophetic timeline? Because the first five trumpets have already occurred. There are many people that teach that the seals, trumpets, and vials in the book of Revelation only can occur during the final seven years. That simply is not the case, folks. The first four seals have already been loosed, and the first five trumpets have already occurred. And this sixth trumpet war is staring us right in the face. Revelation 9, 13 through 16 says, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. The Euphrates is housed in Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, four nations. And the four angels were loosed, which are prepared for an hour a day, a month, and a year, for to slay. Now this is going to be their job when they're loosed. For to slay the third part of men. Some translations say the third part of all of the earth's population. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, 000, and I heard the number of them. So we know three things here. We know that it's going to emanate out of the Middle East region, the Euphrates River region, that one third of the world's population will be destroyed as a result of this war, and an army of 200 million soldiers will participate in this war. And so we know scripturally, I can prove, that this war will take place just before or shortly after, I don't know which one which, the peace agreement is signed. And the Bible does tell us that it must take place at the latest 
before the final three and one half years of the final seven years. So folks, listen very closely. It could conceivably happen at any time if it has not already begun. You say, oh Dave, you're just sensationalizing things. Oh no, I'm not. Look at the situation that's going on with Iran and their belief in the, their Mahdi figure, this Messiah figure that they believe that they are religiously bound to, draw, to annihilate Israel and the United States to get rid of them off the planet to destroy them completely so that will quicken the coming of their Mahdi or their Messiah figure who wants to establish the Shiite version of Sharia law globally, in essence creating a world governing body, and they see Israel and the United States as standing in the way of them doing that. So now you know, hence Hezbollah, Hamas, the Ring of Fire, the Houthis, all these Iranian proxies trying to come against Israel. Israel is actually fighting a seven front war. And so, has, has World War III already begun? I don't know. A lot of people believe it has, and it has just not escalated to the point where we would see mass casualties. Now, folks, I'm telling you, this is Bible Prophecy 101. If you understand about the peace agreement, you understand about the war, these things are the next two to happen on God's prophetic timeline. And again, if all of these major news sources understood this, they could do a lot better job of reporting on what really is coming. Now they speculate. But the Bible lays it out clear. So when the final seven years begins, Revelation 11, 1 and 2 says the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, that's going to be placed under a sharing arrangement between the Jews and Muslims. The Jewish people are going to be allowed to build their third temple. Um, the third temple is mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, and Revelation 11, 1 and 2. They're going to build it up on the Temple Mount. When the temple is completed, they're going to resume animal sacrifices. That's Daniel 9, 27. And it's just as they did in the Old Testament times. The Bible says that's going to happen, folks. And the Bible prophecies always come to pass. So I don't have to sit here and scratch my head and go, man, I wonder if they're going to resume sacrifices in the future. No, the Bible says the Antichrist will cause the sacrifices to cease. So if he's going to cause them to cease, then they have to have been reinstituted. And, you know, as a side note, I will tell you that I just talked to my good friend Byron Stinson the other day, and he's the guy that found the red heifers in Texas, just maybe 15 miles from our headquarters here, and they ended up shipping five of them as pets uh, to Israel. And he says that they are now, I just talked to him maybe a week or two ago, he says they're now of age, and they're ready for the purification offering, and that they are planning to sacrifice a red heifer in April at Passover. And he did tell me that they were going to try to keep the ceremony low-key due to all of the hostility in the West Bank and Gaza. Now, however, I think that that's going to be virtually impossible because it, it, to me it's one, almost one of the most recognizable prophecies in the last 2,000 years if you understand all this stuff. And he originally invited me to be part of, at the ceremony, but obviously circumstances have changed dramatically with the war and uh, all of the escalation and violence out in the West Bank and Judea and different things. So um, not sure that I'm going to be able to, to be there for that. But uh, I'm certainly on the front lines with all of it because um, Byron and I have become just fabulous friends so, the, you know that they need this red heifer to be sacrificed as a purification sacrifice to resume the animal sacrifices that will happen day and night up on the Temple Mount. And they're planning on sacrificing that thing in April at Passover. So, the offering of animal sacrifices in the Temple, they're going to quickly escalate into a, a world crisis. Imagine when these animals are being sacrificed every day, every day, every day on television, well, the animal rights activists, they're going to demand, hey, the Antichrist, you're in control of this. Stop the slaughter of these animals. <coughs> well, this dispute over the animal sacrifices, that's going to lead to an event called, the Bible calls the abomination 
of desolation. I mean, once we reach the middle of this final um, seven-year period, prophetic fulfillments, they're going to rapidly increase with many events happening almost simultaneously. And I know I'm focused on Israel here today uh, and partially the Middle East, but there are many events, the, the, the war in heaven, many things will happen, the beginning of the Great Tribulation, that happen right there at that three-and-a-half-year mark. And the first of these events will be the stopping of the sacrifices at the abomination of desolation. Daniel 11.31 foretells the event. It says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they, the Antichrist and his partners, shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. So it appears that stopping the sacrifices and the abomination of desolation when um, the, the Antichrist will stand in a, in, in a Jewish temple proclaiming to be God, that that's going to happen about, at about the same time. Uh, you know, apparently the Antichrist is going to explain, hey, the sacrifices, you guys don't need these anymore because I'm the Messiah. He's, the Bible says he's going to claim to be God. I'm the Messiah. I'm God. I'm your Mahdi, Muslims. I'm your fifth uh, Buddha. I'm your twelfth Imam. He's going to claim to be God to everybody. And that's the abomination of desolation when he stands in the temple and does that. 2 Thessalonians 2 4 states that he will sit in the temple of God claiming to be God. So, simultaneous with the abomination of desolation, there's going to be a war in heaven. It's Daniel 12 1 and, uh, and Revelation 12 7 through 10. Michael and his archangels will defeat Satan and his angels and they can find them to the earth. No more access to heaven for Satan. And so you can see the dynamics of everything happening here right halfway through this final seven year period. And this is going to be the future. All of, all of this is confined right there in Israel. The war will be in the Middle East and around the world. But most of these events are, are right there in Israel. And so you can see if the major news sources only understood this, wow how they could report on it in the future. A voice spoke to me and said, I've got something I want to show you. I was so sure God had talked to me. And I was stunned by what I saw. A direct fulfillment of this over 2,500-year-old prophecy. The United States will stand with Israel. Why haven't I ever seen this before? One-third of humanity will die. What do these beasts symbolize? The lion, the bear, the leopard. The combined beast from Revelation 13 represents the end-time government of the Antichrist. Understanding the end time. Now streaming on End Time Plus and available to order at endtime.com slash UET. Go to endtime.com slash UET or call 800 End Time. What if you could understand Bible prophecy? Dave Robbins, the host of the End Time Show's TV and radio programs, is holding a free prophecy conference near you. Gain peace and understanding about what the Bible says concerning End Time prophecy. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com slash events to see when Dave will be in a location near you. I'm continuing my study here on the future of Israel. So many news articles and different things are asking questions and trying to figure out what's going to happen to Israel in the near future. Will they sign a peace agreement with the Israelis, Palestinians, creating a two-state solution? Well, the Bible tells us absolutely that they will. The Bible lays out the future of Israel just like an, like an open book that you can flip to and say, okay, here's what's going to happen, then this, then this. And so I'm continuing through that today and we're halfway through the final seven-year period here. Revelation 12, 12 says that uh, there's been a, a war in heaven. Michael and his archangels overcome Satan and his angels, bind them to the earth. And then Revelation 12, 12 says, 
Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath. Now this is the wrath of Satan. This is the, this is the great tribulation. Because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So this is the beginning of the final three and one half years of the tribulation when Satan will persecute Israel and the true church of Jesus Christ. The Bible goes on to say in Revelation 12 that he will persecute those that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's the church. And this is the same great tribulation that Jesus prophesied about in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 through 21. And he said there were, there's going to be a time of persecution that has, such as never has been on the earth or ever will be. So folks, there, in looking at Israel's future, at least out in the West Bank and, and around portions of the world, there's going to be another Jewish holocaust ahead, and something has to be done. We've got to warn the Jews, right? Because we can talk about this all day long, but if we don't get into the game, I don't want to be sitting on the bleachers in the end time. I've got to get into the, I've got to get on the playing field. I've got to do so. What are we going to do about all this? We know there's going to be a, a, um, another Jewish Holocaust. Are we just going to sit back and say, oh, oh, let me see. Uh, I, I, it's going to happen, so, oh, well. No, absolutely not. We're going to warn them to flee. The Bible, Jesus told them to do that. In uh, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus was answering the disciples' question on the Mount of Olives concerning the end of the age. And they, were, they asked him, what's going to be the sign of your coming of the end of the age? He goes down to about verse 15, 16 through 21, and, and he, he foretold a Jewish holocaust that would occur. And we now know that it will be the Jews' second holocaust. And the thing is, though, this is a New Testament prophecy. And the Jewish people, they don't study the, 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 the New Testament. And they're going to be blindsided when this prophecy occurs, right? Unless somebody warns them. The global rise of anti-Semitism, I mean, I can see it here in Dallas. It's setting the stage for this event to occur soon. With the stuff that's happening with Israel and Gaza, right out here in front of End Time Ministries television studios, last Friday, I saw a gentleman standing up through the sunroof of a car, he had a Palestinian flag, and they were driving in front of our building here. Now, folks, that brings it close to home, doesn't it? A month or so ago, there was a pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas parade just in back of our television studios over here about probably a, maybe a less than a quarter of a mile at Jupiter and Plano Parkway, just right behind us. And... I thought, man, anti-Semitism, is just, there's just a swell of it around the world. And somebody needs to warn the Jewish people what's coming. The prophecy located in Matthew 24, 15 through 21. Jesus said, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation occur, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Well, again, what's the abomination of desolation? when the Antichrist will stand in a rebuilt Jewish temple proclaiming to be God. Folks, you and I are going to see this on the internet and on television. We're going to watch these events happen. I may be there when it happens. But Jesus said, when you see that event happen, let them which be in Judea, the modern day West Bank, you're going to have to flee into the mountains. They're not going to flee down into Petra or over into Jordan. They're going to come into Israel proper. And which would be, they're going to come to the west. You understand the, where the West Bank region is now. And that's out in the, the 1967 borders out there towards Jordan. It's going to be those Jews that have stayed out there in that Palestinian state. Jesus said he warned them to flee. But the Jews don't follow this portion of the Bible. Who's going to warn them? It's going to be somebody that understands. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 and 33. The Bible says that, during the time of the Antichrist, they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits, and they that understand among the people shall do what? Keep it to themselves? No. They shall instruct many. So God's given us a big job, hasn't he? And the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. So Jesus said, when you see that event occur, let them which be in Judea flee. 
Let him which is on the house stop. Man, you don't go back into your house. If you're out in the field um, working, don't go back to get your clothes. For then shall be great tribulation. Then's going to be the greatest time of persecution at what Jesus is saying, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, it's not going to be like this ever again. Now, the bad news is another Jewish holocaust is coming. It's prophesied in the Bible, and the prophecies always come to pass. The good news is that there's a way for the Jews to escape the coming slaughter. Jesus gave this warning specifically so that those who would listen would escape. You say, well, but there's got to be somebody to warn them. Well, guess what? We here at End Time Ministries intend to do everything within our power to make sure that every Jew living in Judea hears the warning of Jesus loud and clear. We're going to be doing email blasts. We're going to be doing door knocking. We're going to be doing everything we can. And it's, it's then going to be up to each of those people to listen and to respond. Some of them won't, but some of them will. And you say, but Dave, that's going to be a big job. Yeah, sure. But with God, all things are possible. I've seen God do some amazing things, some miraculous things. And so I can't say, yeah, but, you know, when it gets to that thing, that's too big for God. No, 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 no. I can't. The last thing we need to do, folks, is put God in a box. God created the heavens and the earth just by speaking. So you think he can't help us warn the Jews out in the West Bank? I promise you he can. And it's worth it because those are souls, everybody. They're people. They're souls. And we've got to reach them. During the last half of this final seven-year period, there, many events are going to occur setting the stage for the eventual battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're seeing it happening right now with the, the rise of anti-Semitism in the earth. The international community is absolutely anti-Israel. Anybody who's trying to get them to sign to trade land, promised land, for peace is anti-Israel. Okay? Now, this, knowing this stuff kind of changes how you read your news, right? And, you know, this seven year, it, it's going to go by quickly. I mean, the older I get, the faster this stuff's moving. During the agreed upon uh, seven year interim agreement, the United Nations status as a recognized world government, that's going to continue to grow. The UN leaders, they're not going to have forgotten the rebellion of Israel over the status of Jerusalem. They tried to get them to come into to conform to their edicts, and Israel said, no, no, no. We're not going to do it. And this unforgivable challenge to the UN authority, that's got to someday, in their mind, be rectified, right? And then you remember Resolution 2334 that, uh, that the Obama administration allowed to pass through the UN Security Council that says Israel's right to East Jerusalem and the West Bank that they're illegally occupying that area in the mind of the international community. They're going against international law. And so he actually set the stage for, Obama helped to set the stage for the Battle of Armageddon. We call that one of the Armageddon resolutions. So as the end of this final seven-year agreement approaches, the Palestinians will begin to, they're going to clamor for East Jerusalem to be placed under Palestinian control. They're talking about at that in the news now, but it's not going to happen till the end of that final seven years. Finally, a resolution is going to be passed by the United Nations requiring Israel that you have to surrender East Jerusalem to the Palestinians. And of course, Israel's going to refuse. And the United Nations, representing the nations of the world, they're going to prepare a military action against Israel in order to enforce its authority. The prophet Zechariah foretold that event 2,500 years ago. He said, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city of Jerusalem shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. That is Zechariah 14.2. 
at the end, very end of the great tribulation period, the seven vials of the wrath of God will be poured out. That's Revelation 16, verses 1 through 21. And when the sixth vial is poured out, the great river Euphrates is dried up in, the, in preparation for the kings of the east to make their way down toward Israel for the battle of Armageddon. A lot of those nations are mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38. Um, Russia, Gog and Magog, uh, Persia, Iran, Togarma, Turkey, uh, Gomer, Eastern Europe, and other nations under a United Nations flag will invade Israel from the, the north. And the battle is going to be joined in the plain of Megiddo, which is, uh, that's where the, the name of the, the world's final battle, Armageddon, comes from. The plain of Megiddo in the northern parts of Israel. And Israel's going to fight valiantly against the world government armies. However, the Israeli defense forces, they're going to fall back. And they're going to slowly but surely uh, be forced by this superior firepower of the world government to be pushed back down the Jordan Valley. And this conflict is going to pr proceed with Israel retreating towards its capital, Jerusalem. That's going to be the last stand of it all, folks. That's where the Battle of Armageddon is going to culminate. And of course, you can only imagine, after days of exhausting battle, Israel's going to make her last stand right there at the walls between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives in that big valley, the Kidron Valley. That's where the Battle of Armageddon is going to, to end. That's where the Bible says the blood will flow to the horse bridles. It's just going to be a bloodbath. And in spite of this heroic effort by the Israeli soldiers, the Jewish people are going to find themselves facing defeat by the armies of the Antichrist. And it's at this time that the seventh and last trumpet's going to sound. Jesus Christ will return to gather the elect from the earth. That's Matthew 29, I'm sorry, Matthew 24, 29 through 31. And they're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb in the sky, and they're going to, they're going to go with the saints to fight on behalf of Israel at the Battle of Armageddon. That's Revelation 19. Jesus is going to come with the armies of heavens with his saints. The book of Jude says he comes with ten thousands of his saints. And it's during the battle of Armageddon that the seventh vial will be poured out upon the earth. Now, folks, these events are just ahead of us now. They're star we're staring them right in the face. And if we can only explain it to all these news programs and all these different people writing these articles around the world, that are asking questions and speculating, what's Israel's future? If you just understood the prophecies of the Bible, it's all laid out right before you very clear. They that understand what is taking place will instruct many. Except a man is born again, he can enter or see the kingdom of God. I don't care what label you've been given or what label you've given yourself. You are essential. You still matter. This is a journey, and when we get to the other side of that, that's where our prize is. That's where our reward is. End time is not going anywhere. During the Battle of Armageddon, the seventh vial will be poured out upon the earth. And that's going to result in great hailstorms being rained upon those armies. It's not going to be global. It's going to be localized right there in Israel. And those hailstorms are going to fall on those armies that have come down to fight against Israel at the Battle of Armageddon. At this point, God is done. He, the Bible says His fury will come up in His face, and He's going to come to take care of business. He's going to protect Israel. And just when it looks like Israel, that they're going to be driven into the sea, Jesus Christ is going to appear, destroy the world government, 
and its leader, the Antichrist, and at the same time, Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years, and we will crown Jesus Christ King of kings and Lord of lords. That's Revelation 20, verse 1 through 2. He's going to bind Satan. Zechariah 14, 4 tells us that Jesus will place his feet on the Mount of Olives just outside of Jerusalem when he comes to the earth. And when Jesus touches down on the Mount of Olives, here's what's going to happen. All of Israel will rush out to meet him because Israel knows and believes that their Messiah is going to come as a conquering king. So when he comes, plants his feet upon the Mount of Olives, boy, they're going to come rushing out to see him, right? Well, when they bow before their Messiah, they're going to notice, the Bible tells us this, the Bible says that they're going to notice the nail scars in his hands and his feet. And they're going to realize that he is Jesus and that he was the Messiah. They're going to receive him as their Lord and their God. Zechariah 12.10, Zechariah 13.6, Scripture tells us in uh, Romans 11.25 and 26 that all of Israel will be saved at this time. The Bible says that they're going to look at the scars in his hands, they're going to say, where'd you get those scars? And he's going to say, these are those with which I got in the house of my friends. And they're going to realize, you're the Messiah and you are Jesus. And then, folks, that one of the things we have to talk about in Israel and around the world, but I'm focused on Israel in these programs, is revival. That's the most important thing for me of all of this. Prophecies clearly foretell that there's a revival coming in which all of Israel is going to be saved. And that's going to happen at the time of the Battle of Armageddon. That's when Jesus comes to the Mount of Olives. Jews will rush out to meet him. They're going to worship their Messiah. When they bow before him, they're going to notice these nail scars in his hands and his feet. And they're going to say, Messiah, where'd you get those wounds? And he's going to say, I received these in a house of my friends. The Jews are going to say, so you're Jesus. And he's going to say, yes, I am. Folks, revival time. All of Israel is going to turn to Jesus, repenting. The Bible says all of Israel is going to be saved. They're going to repent of their unbelief. Now, this will be Jews that didn't make it, that made it through the Battle of Armageddon, and that made it through the Great Tribulation. You understand? And they're going to repent of their unbelief, and he's going to forgive them. And the Bible says that all of them that have survived the Great Tribulation and the wrath of God, they're going to turn to Jesus in mass. However, there's another revival coming first. We believe when the Jews flee from Judea and come to our, they're going to come to our prophecy college, God will send a great revival that day. The, the, um, you understand that we own a prophecy college in downtown Jerusalem, the Jerusalem Prophecy College. I teach a class in that every week from our studios right here in Dallas. There's many things that happen in the college all week long. The missionaries work out of there. They have services there, Bible studies there, all kinds of stuff in our college in downtown Jerusalem. So it, that, that college was established. I teach Jews there every week. The college was established to train people, to help people there understand what's going on in the end times, and to help facilitate the revival that's coming. God's going to send a great revival that day, and Zechariah 12, 7, it substantiates what we have come to believe. It says, the Lord also shall save the tents of Judah, which is those living out in the West Bank. It's going to save them first. And this is going to happen before the revival in which all of Israel is saved at the second coming of Jesus Christ. I've actually heard people say, well, the Bible in no place teaches a, a great end time revival. And I'm like, what version of the Bible are you reading? The, the Bible's very clear on a great end time revival. The Bible says, The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. You can see this happening in the news. Uh, you say, well, what's this all about? Well, right now in Israel, the people who live in Israel proper, they look kind of look down their noses at the Jews that live in Judea or the modern-day West Bank because they see them as... A, a blockade to peace. They think that they're, these guys are religious extremists and they're irresponsible rednecks living out there, 
and they believe that because the Jews of Judea are determined to keep their houses out there in these in what they call the occupied territories, uh, biblical Judea and Samaria, that they're just they're just extremists. So the Jews in pre-1967 Israel believe the settlers are endangering the state of Israel. They say to those living in Judea, the modern-day West Bank, if you would just come back into Israel proper, turning over all the land that we captured in 1967 war, the world would love us. And Because right now the world international community is against Israel. They say that if you do that, the world would love us. And there are very high high level politicians in Israel that believe this. They're the ones that will sign on to a two state solution in the future. They say right now we're in danger of being marginalized and ostracized by the entire world because of you radical Jews that want to live out there in the West Bank or, or Judea. So the Jews that don't take God's word seriously, they kind of look down their noses at the Jews living in Judea. The Jews of Judea, they're attempting to obey God's commandment. Uh, the Bible said, Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which, is, which the Lord swear unto your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give unto them and to their seed after them. That's Deuteronomy 1.8. And that's what the Jews in Judea tried to do. And they're going out there occupying the land. They're possessing the land. Now the Jews in Israel proper kind of looked down upon them. And God said, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'll send a revival to the people of Judea that tried to do my will. I'll send them the revival first. Now, isn't this awesome how God laid out the Bible for us to follow? I've had people say, oh man, what's the point in studying Bible prophecy? I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. There's no way you would understand all of these great end time revivals, all of the events that will happen in the end time unless you understand Bible prophecy. You don't get that from studying the other 70% of the Bible. Most people think we're going to be gone before a lot of this stuff happens even. But that's going to be some of the most exciting time. I know that sounds crazy to some people, but I'm not afraid of the end time. I'm looking forward to participating in the great end time revival. If you love revival, you understand what I'm saying. So what's going to happen? Well, we know that a great revival took place in the city of Jerusalem back on the day of Pentecost. Read Acts chapter 2. And that was about uh, 2,000 years ago. Does anyone believe that God could do that again? Well, the Scriptures tell us there's going to be a time of great revival right before and during the time of great tribulation. Listen, and let me, I'll quote it to you. The Bible says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he the Antichrist corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many. That's Daniel eleven thirty two and 33. The, the, this scripture is the reason that we named our, uh, understand, our End Times 14 DVD series, Understanding the End Time. So between End Times Jerusalem Prophecy College, our prophecy conferences in Jerusalem, digital efforts, and the distribution of End Time magazines to every home in Israel, during the final seven years, we're going to do everything we possibly can to impart understanding to the Jewish people. Once the final seven years hits and we know the peace agreement's been signed, End Time Ministries is going to send a magazine to every home in Israel. You say, why in the world would you do that? Because I believe the Bible. There's going to be a great time of revival in the near future. Uh, Revelation chapter 7. John saw a multitude that no man could number out of every kindred, people, tongue, and nation. The elder looks at John and said, John, who are these? And John goes, I don't know, thou knowest. And the elder said, these are they that came out of great tribulation. Not just Jews. A great revival. And, you know, recently there was legislation that was introduced by the Knesset, some Knesset members to imprison people who tried to share the gospel in Israel. But Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu dismissed that effort. He said no. He, said, he tweeted that in both English and Hebrew, we will not advance any law against the Christian community. So guess what? God always makes a way, doesn't he? I wasn't afraid. I know God called us to do this. And many of you are 
supporting us and helping us in this endeavor because you believe the Bible too. The promised Jewish revival is in progress right now. Ezekiel 37 records a prophecy of the valley full of dry bones. And God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, I, I don't know, God. These bones, are, they're pretty dry. And God said, Ezekiel, you prophesied of those bones. Ezekiel prophesied, the bones began to come together, and this is the prophecy foretelling the end of the Jewish exile. The Jews were in exile from 70 AD until May 14, 1948. They were banished from their homeland, sifted through the nations for, what, uh, over 1,800 years. Now God has miraculously brought them back together to the promised land, and you and I have witnessed the fulfillment of this amazing prophecy. However, the fulfillment of the prophecy, it's not done yet. Ezekiel prophesied that bones came together, muscle came on the bones, and that's how that's, that's now happened. Israel is now the mightiest military force in the Middle East. And next on the prophecy came flesh on the muscle, and then God said, I will put my spirit in them. That's not happened yet. But it's going to happen. The Jewish revival will be completed during the final seven years, culminating at the Battle of Armageddon. And, you know, End Time Ministries, with your participation, plans to be part of that great revival. Think of it. You and I have the privilege of participating in this prophesied revival for the end time. And you, you can partner with End Time Ministries to help us with that endeavor by visiting www.warnthejews.com. To my knowledge, we're the only ones talking about it on the planet. And so, once again, consider what the Bible has to say in Genesis 12, 3. God told Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curseth thee. This is our chance to be a blessing to the people of Israel. Before this occurs, we've got much work to do, don't we? Global anti-Semitism is riding dramatically, setting the stage for the next Jewish Holocaust. We've got to warn the Jews. And of course, the stage is being set right now. Attacks on Jews are rising globally after the October 7th, and th those are rising exponentially right now. And in the wake of this recent Hamas massacre, this disconcerting report was released in late of October 2023, stating that uh, there was a 500% surge in anti-Semitic incidents globally compared to the same time frame the previous year. And even in the West Bank, Judea, there's a rise in anti-Semitism and a rise in violence in that region. It's all setting the stage for what's coming in the very near future. Tell you what I'm doing. I'm looking forward to that great end time revival. It's what I'm all about. Preparing people for the second coming of Jesus Christ and building God's kingdom here on the earth. God bless you and thank you for supporting us.